to Epiphany Fellowship's podcast, where our goal is to see people everywhere show off the glory of Christ in every area of life. We pray that you are blessed and encouraged by today's message and will allow the Word of God to dwell in you richly. Whose mercies endure forever. chapter 5 as today we will uh, we'll finish up with our James series how your faith works James chapter 5 beginning at verse 7 if you're there say amen if you need some more time just go ahead and look up at the screen somebody uh, I know we normally read together I'm gonna to read for your hearing this afternoon is that all right yeah. amen why don't you follow along with me James chapter 5 beginning at verse 7 here's the word of the Lord it says therefore brothers and sisters be patient until the Lord's coming see how the farmers wait for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. You must also be patient. Strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. Brothers and sisters, do not complain about one another so that you will not be judged. For look, the judge stands at the door. Brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name as an example of suffering and patience. See, we count as blessed those who have endured you have heard of Job's endurance and have seen the outcome that the Lord brought about for the Lord is compassionate and merciful I just want to tag our text this afternoon this afternoon teach me how to wait teach me how to wait father We come before you as a needy people, a people who are desperately in need of your grace, desperately in need of your mercy. And so we say thank you because we know that as desperate as we are, that when we pray, we have what we need. So help us, O God, to be a prayerful people, to make use of the access that has been given us by your son, Jesus. Help us, O God, as we hear this word today, to be not just hearers of the word, but doers also, so that our lives might be changed and transformed and renewed by your grace. This we pray in the name of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you agree with that, say amen. And amen. You may be seated. So I I have uh, not, well, not just me by myself, but me and my wife have four beautiful children. And uh, we've made a habit of doing some things with them over the years. And if you have young kids and you don't do this, um, I want you to pay attention because I'm going to give you some additional resources to add to your toolbox. And if you don't have kids but want kids in the future, then just slip this in your back pocket for later use. But we've made a habit of not telling our kids anything that's going to happen in the future until it happens. I see some of you in here can relate to my testimony. And, it, and it's, it's not that we don't want to surprise them. It's really more for our sanity. Because it, it, we're, we're trying to keep one of two things from happening. One, 
We want to save them from disappointment and a potential butt whooping um, because of their disappointment um, when what we've told them just doesn't come about. Because you know, you know, kids don't understand anything about the fact that life just happens sometimes and plans get canceled, right? They, they don't wanna hear that noise, right? If you told them, then it's happening. The other reason, and this is more often the reason why we tell them this, is simply because I, I don't want you to ask me about it every day. Some of y'all don't got kids, that's why you don't know what I'm talking about. But this past May, we, we decided to take our kids down to Florida, you know, down to you know, Disneyland area, and we made the fatal mistake of telling them back in February. I know. But February to May ain't that long. Like, it's just a few months. I mean, it ain't like I had them waiting a year. It's I had them waiting a few months. Nonetheless, my, my four-year-old, she kept asking us after we told them uh, we were going to Disney World in, in May, is it May yet? <laughs> Every day. Every morning, she woke up, she would ask us, is this the day when we're going to May? She would phrase it like that because she associated the trip with May. So she would ask us, are we going to May yet? And, and when we had to disappoint her by saying, no, baby, it's not time yet. We got a couple months left. It's, it's right around the corner, though. Like, you know, we only got 40. I had to do a countdown, 45 days. She can't even count to 45, but I was giving her day numbers. And, 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 and whenever I would disappoint her, she would say the same thing. She would say, ah, it's taking too long. I mean, at four, who are you to be all exasperated? Like, like, you're not even paying for this trip. But, but the reality was she was dissatisfied with anything that was going on between now and then because in her mind, the only thing that mattered was May. If I could slip a word in here for us. Sometimes the anticipation of the future causes us to treat the season that we're in with contempt. And so, so by, the, by the time we get to, by the time we get to, to James chapter five, you know, if I could do a little, uh, a little kind of walk us back a little bit, James in chapter one, he, he's already, he's talked about what builds Christian maturity. And then in chapter two, he talks about the relationship between our faith and our works uh, displayed in our treatment of people. And then in chapter three, he talks about the destruction that can come from improper uses of the tongue and what godly wisdom looks like. And then in chapter four, he gives them a little rebuke uh, because they, they've been quarreling and they've been dealing with a lot of selfishness in the community. And, and so when we, when we look at James, big picture, we see there's a theme kind of running underneath uh, what James has been writing, that, that James talks a lot about the rich and their treatment of the poor. And here in chapter five, James begins to direct his attention towards the poor, and he begins to set up a theme of patience throughout this passage. Specifically, uh, patience that deals with the oppression experienced by the poor at the hands of the rich. It's interesting to note that the, the, the root word for patience occurs four times in five verses, and the word for perseverance occurs twice, which lets us know that, 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 or whenever you see a, a, a one word used in a short amount of time in scripture, you need to key in on that word because it means that something's being communicated that's of very importance. That, not very importance, but y'all know what I mean. That's important. Amen, somebody. Sometimes your mouth just be running before your brain catch up with you. Um, but, but, but this idea of patience and perseverance that's undergirding this text carries with it the idea of calm and expectancy. The words associated with perseverance here convey the sense of patient endurance and fortitude. And so I, I, I just got three things I want us to kind of 
wrestle and work through today, and then I'm going to be out your way. The first of these is this, that patient endurance is not dismayed by a lack of self-control. Or not self-control, but a lack of control. Patient endurance is not dismayed by a lack of control. Look, look at verse 7. He says, therefore, brothers and sisters, be patient. Now, now the tone of James' re- rhetoric here finds a new sort of pastoral level because he switches from in chapter 4 saying, you who say, and in chapter 5 saying, you rich, which is more accusatory, to, to now the operative word being beloved and how he addresses his audience, beloved or brothers and sisters. And so the the first word of this passage indicates for us that there's been a change in tone with James and who he's writing to. And so it's clear that his eyes have shifted from the rich oppressors that we see him talking to in the earlier portion of this chapter to those in the community who are the faithful followers of Jesus. How do we know this? We know this because earlier in verse 4, it says that God has heard the cries of the poor that are being oppressed in the fields because of what they're experiencing at the hands of these rich farmers. And and, and so, uh, 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 so James here tells them to be patient. It's the first of the commands that James gives them to be patient. And, And the command needs to be tied vocabularically, I know that's a word, look it up, uh, to the word endure that we'll see in in verse 11, later on in in verse 11. And so the the term patience in this context and taken as a whole in this passage denotes fortitude, steadfastness, patience in the context of stress, trial, and suffering. And and, and so he doesn't just tell them to be patient, he then gives them the, the, the why to be patient. He says, be patient until the Lord's coming. This is the, the word per, parousia. It, it means a presence or appearing. Now, this word is often thought of as Christ's return, when Christ comes, his second coming, and or the rapture of the church, his, his body, those who have followed him by faith. But, but, but one of the things we have to keep in mind It's unlike Paul, there's nothing in James' context that indicates that he knows anything of the rapture-like act of God where the Lord Jesus descends to earth. And so the, 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 the mistake that we would make in assuming that James means what Paul means is, is, that, is that we would have to assume that what Paul means, James has to mean. Right? The interesting thing about this is that James sometimes uses the word Lord to refer to Jesus. But more often than not, he uses it to refer to God the Father. And so the parousia here refers to the manifestation of God the Father's righteous judgment and establishment of justice, most likely in the destruction of Jerusalem that happens in 70 AD, but has not yet happened in James' writing. Now, now, now how, 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 do we, how do we get that? Well, if, if you look back at the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus uses this word parousia, and, and it refers to the destruction of Jerusalem and the deliverance of the church or God's people from that destruction. And so one of the things that we have to acknowledge is that James' use of parousia is more like Jesus's use of parousia than Paul's use, where it means the act of God on earth in judgment against the disobedient, i.e. the oppressors, that entails probably vindication for the righteous, the poor, and the obedient. The, The inference then can be made that the cries of the poor that God heard in verse four he is now acting on in judgment to establish justice. And so the simple moral virtue of patience is not on James's mind here, nor is the general notion of waiting for God's promise. He is thinking more specific, and his thinking is more shaped by eschatology. And so when we turn to a passage like this in verses 7 uh, through 11, we encounter an emphasis on patience and perseverance in an eschatological framework 
That is, because the Lord is coming soon as judge, James's hearers are to be patient. And so an eschatological reading of this verse leads us to the conclusion that James and what he's doing by telling them to be patient is giving them a warning against community violence. He's urging them to wait on God to take vengeance and vindicate them. I mean, we see, we see that in Deuteronomy chapter 32, don't we? It, it says, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay. In time, their foot will slip. But in time for that to happen means you got to give time for that to happen. Right? For the day of their disaster is what? It's near. And their doom is quickly coming. And so his counsel... The counsel that James is giving these poor Christians who are under oppression is different than the growing influence of the message that they're hearing among the zealous, which is take up arms and fight for yourself. And so James tells them to be patient, and then he doesn't stop there. He gives them a little example. He gives them an example that they could be familiar with because it has to do with farming, and they are from an agricultural society. And so look what he says. He says, he says see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. Now, in, in the Eastern Mediterranean, two seasons of rain are normal and necessary for a successful crop. The emphasis here is double. Not only is it on patience, but it's also on the surety of the farmer that the rains and harvest will indeed come each in its own season. And, and, and so if, 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 if you're a farmer, you would be hearing this and you know and can relate to like how much control you don't have in the waiting. And so psychologically, the waiting is hard because you have to deal with the unpredictability of the weather. And it's this unpredictability of the weather that plays a major part in the success of the crops. So not only do you have to wait for something that is outside of yourself, but the thing that you're depending on, you can't even depend on because you don't know how it's gonna operate. And so the farmer is helpless. But, but, but here's, here's one of the things I want us to know, that the waiting also involves a good deal of hard work. Because, because the farmer, after he plants the seeds, he does not stop the work that he needs to do in order to make sure his crop is successful as far as it depends on him. Let, let, me, let me just throw a word in here. Uh, prayerful waiting shouldn't involve you being actionless. I'll make it plain. I'll make, make it plain. Um, and I'm going to just make it plain and move on. If you need a job, you don't just sit on your couch. Now, you've prayed, God, I need a job real bad. I need a job. I need to work. I need some money. I got to pay these bills. But, but if you need a job, you don't just pray and then sit on your couch and wait for somebody to call you. What do you do? You put in an application. Some of y'all sounded a little confused about what you do next. If you need a job, you put in an application. Now, 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 you couldn't say, no one would say that you lacked faith for putting in an application because you had already prayed. They would say that you put in an application after you prayed was actionable faith. Because just like the farmer, you have no control over whether or not you want to get that job, but it doesn't mean that you stay actionless. And so as the farmer expects crops, but waits patiently for the rains, so the poor are to expect God's judgment, but wait patiently for God to bring it about. As the farmer waits for a precious crop, so the poor are to await their reward for their obedience. As the farmer awaits the faithfulness of God to provide both the early and late rains, so they are to wait until the coming of the Lord. And so he says, while you're waiting, 
strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. That word near speaks of something so near that its impact is beginning to be felt. It's, it's used often in the New Testament, and, and one is in Mark chapter 11, verse 1, where it says that when they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. The point is that they were close enough, but not, had not yet gotten there yet. But they were so close that Jesus sent his two disciples ahead to get things ready. Let, let, me, let, me, let me see if I can make it plain. Uh, you know, when you're, when you're flying on a plane and you're preparing to descend, like you haven't gotten to your destination yet, but you're almost there, there's a number of things that they have you to, to do to start preparing for the landing. You haven't gotten there yet, but there's certain things you must do to prepare for a landing. And so what do they tell you to do? They tell you to take your seats and fasten your seatbelt, turn off your devices and stow away your tray table, make sure your seat is in the upright position and all items are placed underneath the chair in front of you. See, Pastor Mark, you're not the only one to know this flight stuff. You know, I might not be able to fly a plane, but I can make the announcements. But, 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 but these are things that you do in preparation for landing, even though you haven't gotten there yet, because you are near. And so the, the way we understand this word near is significant to our passage because it can be used to describe a cataclysmic eschatological event. That's why Jesus can say, the kingdom of God has drawn near. It, it's, it's why we talk about living in the already but not yet. That the kingdom of God has not fully come, but it's close enough that you can feel it. And so, so when, we, when we get to this verse, it's like certainly James is calling on Christians to allow God to judge the wicked. But the interesting thing is to, to, to appropriate to ourselves the task of judgment is to call down God's judgment on ourselves. Like it, 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 would be like, it would be like one of your siblings when you were long, younger um, doing something bad enough to you to get a whooping. And while they're getting a whooping, you try to jump in front of the belt and give them a whooping yourself. I know why you're laughing, because it don't make sense. Because they're not getting two whoopings now. They're being whooped by you. And you, who didn't do nothing, who ain't got no business being in the situation now, is now being whooped when all you had to do was stay out the way. That, this is what James is saying. James is saying, sometimes when you take judgment upon yourself, instead of waiting on the Lord, the discipline that he wants to give people, he can't give because you're in the way. That brings me to my second point. It, it, patient endurance waits on God's judgment. Good. Look at verse 9. It says, brothers and sisters, do not complain about one another so that uh, you will not be judged. For look, the judge stands at, at, at the door. Now, of, of concern here in the complaint, the type of complaining that James is referencing, it's, it's the kind of grumbling connected to the reader's impatience with their situation. But one must imagine that the oppressive conditions uh, uh, that they find themselves in led them to the temptation to not only violence, but also turning against one another and God. Because oppression often leads to consternation and a yearning desire to find a way out. Y'all quiet in here. Nobody wants to be underneath oppression. Nobody. And so, so if you're, li listen, I, I struggle with this too, is like whenever I'm in a situation that doesn't feel favorable, I'm looking for the exit. And the fact that you agreed with me 
lets me know that all of us got a little bit of prosperity gospel in us. You can deny it if you want to, but that feeling of angst and agitation when God takes you through stuff that causes you to look for an exit, you, you have something built into you that tells you that because of your relationship with the Lord, I shouldn't be experiencing this. And, and that's why you look for an exit, because your first response is the same as it, 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 it's the same faulty reasoning of why it's not my first response. It's because I feel like I shouldn't be here. And so I don't think about what God's trying to teach me. I think about the fact that this ain't supposed to be happening because I'm a good Christian. I ain't perfect, but I should be good enough to have to not face no trials. And so, so James, James, has, James has a warning for them. He, he, he has a warning for them as well. He says, in, in spite of the abuse that you've endured, don't grumble. Because he, he wants to remind them that the wealthy, the ones who are so often the self-imposed enemies of the poor, are still brothers and sisters and fellow believers in Christ. And so even understandable enmities for what they may have suffered at the hands of indifferent wealthy people in the community lays the poor open to judgment. And so these, these two sentences of verse 9 are tied together as indicating both the reality of judgment and the imminence of judgment. And, and, and so what he wants them to understand is there are some certainties with this judgment. What's certain is that God is at the door. What's implied is that the messianic community might experience the sword if they don't repent. If they choose to grumble against one another, the one standing at the door will move that potentiality for judgment into a divine reality. I.e., when humans seek to judge, we usurp the authority of the one whose sole prerogative it is to judge. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I don't like waiting. I, I struggle with waiting. I find it really difficult because I want what I want now. Now, sometimes that has to do with, with materialistic things, but, but even more when an injustice is done against me because I want to feel vindicated. And, and, and here's the thing with me, I can be a little petty. I don't want future vindication. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. No, no, no. I, because, because for me, that's too long. Because by the time vindication comes back, God, they don't forgot why you vindicating. Who you vindicating? I want the vindication to come close enough so that they know this for what they did against me. I don't want them thinking about somebody else for my vindication. Y'all can act all righteous if you want to. I want them to know. But he says to them, he says, look, the judge stands at the door. This, this image is, it gives the same image that we see in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, where it says, behold, I stand at the door and knock, right? That, that, that God has heard the cries, has drawn near, and the judge is standing at the door, meaning that, that the image is an act of imminent, uh, is one of an imminent act of God that will establish justice and send the message that the oppressed have been vindicated. And what's interesting here is this, this idea is not new to the people of God. And so the first time they experience this is not going to be in, in, in future years when God uses the Roman army to come in and destroy the temple and ransack Jerusalem. We, they've seen this before. All you got to do is open your Bible and look at the Old Testament where God used the Assyrians and the Babylonians to come in and conquer and enslave his people while they were in Israel. Y'all remember them stories? Look, look here, here's a side note. I love the fact, and we don't talk about this enough, but I love the fact that God often throughout the course of human history has used foreign, non-covenantal, unbelieving people as a tool of discipline against his people. That's a hard word. And so, so, so 
But, but, that's, but that's true, right? Like, like Israel was experiencing this not because they were no longer his people. They were experiencing this because they were his people, right? The Lord disciplines those whom he loves, right? But what he wants them to see is that complaining, it, 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 it doesn't lead to peace, but it leads to disorder. And, 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 and re- like complaining really doesn't alleviate any of the problems that exist. And so he tells them, wait for the Lord because he's near and his judgment is imminent. Lastly, patient endurance defines blessed differently. Look, 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 look with me at, at verse, verse 10. He says, he says, brothers and sisters, uh, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name as an example of suffering and patience. Now, now the grammar is perhaps an example of, of a hendiadis, which is using two words to express one thought. But, but, but that's not necessarily what's happening here. The better translation is suffering and patience as two distinct elements, meaning that in, in, in any way, James wants the two terms kept close together because he's speaking here of a patience in suffering or a suffering with patience. So much so that the two words virtually combine to form the word endure that we see in verse 11. And, and, and so, so, so which prophets specifically is James referring to here in verse 10? Well, I'm glad you asked. James defines the prophets as all of those, those who spoke in the name of the Lord. Their message, get this, brought them suffering. And in that suffering, they waited patiently for God's vindication. And so what James is trying to get them to understand is that prophets who were everywhere esteemed and held as God's special instruments are examples for them of of the fact that though much esteemed, they suffered too. And so he says, he says, see, we count as blessed those who have endured. We call or we call blessed those who have endured. Inherent in this statement is an undertone of chapter 1, verse 12, where he says that, that, that the Messianic community was promised that endurance, prompted as it is by the steadfast love of God, will re- lead to reward, where he says they'll get a crown of righteousness. Thus, we call blessed, in the sense of being blessed by God, also implies to them, you will be too if you endure in spite of oppression. Right, look, 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 what, uh, look what Matthew chapter 5, what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, it, it kind of stands behind uh, both of those texts in, in James chapter 1 and here in James chapter 5. This is what Jesus says. He says, you are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and, false, and falsely say every kind of evil against you. But listen, he says, because of me. Not because of you. And that's a key difference. You know, if you just a jerk, you know, you're not experiencing godly oppression. People just don't like you because you're a jerk. <laughs> he said, because of me. He said, be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted who? The prophets who were before you. And so the grammar of this verse suggests that this blessedness is reserved for those who have been faithful to the end. It's where we get this idea of the perseverance of this of the saints, faithfulness to the end, right? And, and, and here, here's the thing, James is talking so much about this idea of perseverance and endurance because he cares about perseverance. Look, look, look what he says in, in chapter one, verses three through four. He says, uh, 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 because you know that the testing of your faith produces what? Produces endurance. And, and let endurance have its full effect so that, purpose clause, so that you may be made mature and complete, lacking nothing. Uh, 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 that, that means in, in the context of severe trial, God's people are being exhorted to take the suffering prophets and take Job as their example and wait for God's timing and judgment. 
Listen, can I, can I, can I give you something for free? Sometimes the in-season word we need to hear is endure. You, you know, too, too, many, too many of us, we, you know, we hear, we hear that the, our season coming and we immediately think materialistic blessing. Oh, oh my, my paycheck about to increase. I'm, I'm going to get that new car. I want. We about to get a, a, bigger, a bigger house. I, I'm, not, like, I'm not going to have to live paycheck to paycheck no, no more. Like we think materialistically and here in the text, that's not what blessed means. Here, here in the text, blessed means the ability to stand up under difficulty. It, 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 it means, it means to, to, to be oppressed and persecuted because of who you are in Christ and, and where you decide to take your stand. And he said, your ability, not by your strength, but by his, to stand up under it, that's what it looks like to be blessed. So we got to endure. We got to endure. We, we got to endure. I remember hearing one time, it says this, if you don't recognize the normalcy of suffering, you'll never grow. Right, because listen, the, the, truth, the truth is, you don't grow without hardship. You, you don't grow when stuff ain't tough. Listen, God has booby-trapped the Christian life so that the way that you primarily grow as a Christian is through difficulty. That, that's why he says, he says, the only way to get to maturity is through endurance. And the only way to endure presupposes that there's difficulty in front of you that you have to stand up underneath. And so if you want to be a mature Christian, guess what that means? Stop running from hard stuff. But, but he goes on, he goes on, he says, uh, he said, you've heard of Job's endurance and, and, and what Job uh, went through. And, and, and it's, it's interesting to hear, to, to see some scholars kind of note uh, the description of Job's example. Because uh, they, they say he was anything but an example of godly person who was patient in the midst of adversity. The canonical book rather pictures Job as a bit self-righteous and overly insistent on getting an explanation for his unjust suffering from the Lord. And, and, and so Job's story tells us in no uncertain terms that he complained. But any reading of Job reveals a character who stuck it out. Who trusted in God. And who did so fully aware of the fundamental injustice he had experienced. And so when it comes to this community then, maybe Job is the perfect example for the oppressed poor. Because patience here need not be understood as quietude or passivity. But perhaps genuine patience involves realities like protesting to God, yet without surrendering one's integrity or one's faith in God or losing the path of following Jesus. Now, listen, I, I'm, I'm not even going to presume that my response to what Job went through would have been as godly. Because if faced with Job's reality, many of us would have taken that as license to go off. I mean, even his friends and family weren't satisfied by his response to tragedy. They wanted him to be indignant and agitated. They wanted him to find somebody to blame. They wanted him to give God a piece of his mind. But instead, guess what he did? He mourned. He prayed. He wrestled. He complained, but he did all of these things by faith. And so, so then he, he tells him, he said, man, look at, the, look at the example of Job and, and the outcome that the Lord brought about. That, that at the end of Job's suffering, God not only forgives his friends because of prayer, Job's prayerfulness, but he also shows mercy to Job by restoring his fortunes. And so James sees this idea of uh, the, the Lord providentially bringing about or what's called, referred to as the Lord's end as days of mercy, restoration, and blessing. And so James appeals 
to the compassion and mercy of God, as he often does, but he does so to assure the poor oppressed in this community that God can remake all things. That just like Job, maybe they will too find the Lord's end better than the beginning. You know, so, some of y'all might know this about me, but I'm a, uh, I'm a 90s R&B head. Love 90s R&B. I love it. Y'all can sit there and, and, and act all sanctified if you want to. I make no apologies. One, one of my favorite groups in, in, in the 90s was a group called New Edition. Ooh. See, some of y'all just exposed yourselves. But they, they had a song, that, and it, it was more mainstream, but they had a song called, Can You Stand the Rain? Some of y'all must be familiar with that song. But look, look, look listen, listen to what the chorus says. They, they, say, they say, sunny days. Everybody loves them. I'm not going to sing it, but, but, but. Everybody loves them, but can you stand the rain? And, 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 then, and then, then listen to what they say. They say, storms will come. Storm, storms will come. Listen, 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 listen. This, is, this is Proverbs chapter 1. Wisdom, wisdom cries out in the streets. E, e, listen, e, even these unbelieving jokers knew that, that, that storms were going to be there. They, they, there was an assumption that everybody was going to go through some storms, that there was no way you could preempt your life to not experience them. But then, then they had the audacity, the unmitigated gall, to say, to say this we know for sure, that storms will come. But then they, then they asked the question, but can you stand the rain? Listen, I, 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 just, I just want to tell you today, Christian, that, that, that yes, yes, you can stand the rain uh, because you're not standing in your strength. You're not standing in your power. You're not standing in your wisdom. You're not standing in your creative creativity. You're not standing in your education. You're not standing in your career. You're not standing in your bank account. You're standing on the strength, the power, the might the love, the mercy, the joy, the patience, the kindness, the compassion of God. And so when they ask the question, can you stand the rain? All you got to know is that you're not standing alone. There's somebody who has stood next to you who stands closer than a brother. And he sent his son to die on the cross for your sins. And if you didn't think that you were loved enough, he said, he, he said, he said, he said, he said this, I, I, he did not count it robbery to stay in the comforts of heaven. But he came down near to where you are so that he could stand with you. And so I know some things in your life aren't going the way you thought they would. I know the bank account is a little light and the note from the doctor doesn't say what you thought it would say. I know you're dealing with issues with your children and in your marriage, but I'm here to tell you, you aren't standing alone. My brothers and sisters, yes, it's hard right now, but if you can just hold on, if you can just hold on a little longer. I promise you, if you hold on to his unchanging hand, everything is going to be all right. Let's pray. God, our Father, God, we say thank you. God, we say thank you. God, we say thank you. If I could speak in every tongues, 
it would not be enough to give your name the praise it deserves. And so Father, our prayer is that this thank you would be enough. Help us today, oh God, to be a people who entrust ourselves to you, the one who judges justly. And that in that waiting, we would be found faithful and receive the crown of righteousness that comes with those who wait on the Lord in all things. And God, we're praying because we know we need help. We need help to do it. Help to do it well so that our waiting isn't done in bitterness and in complaining. Give us hearts, oh God, that wait with joy. This we pray in the mighty and matchless name of your son, Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Would you stand with me as we prepare to take communion? If you are in need of a cup and the cracker could you please raise your hand high so we can see you we want to make sure everyone that wants to participate can share in this moment with us our hospitality team is coming around as we speak to come find you if you have your hand raised Jesus before he was crucified told his disciples that as often as they come together they are to remember him we still have a few in the balcony up here to, to my right and so for us as those who are followers of Jesus Christ we come together and we remember him we remember the sacrifice that was made for us in our place and so the night that Jesus was to be betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body, which has been broken and beaten for you. And as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. And afterwards, he took the cup and he blessed it and said, this is my blood, which has been poured out for your sins. And again, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. Would you receive the Lord's benediction? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up your countenance and give you peace from now and forevermore. If you agree with that, say amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. Love on somebody you didn't come with today, and we will see you next week. Awesome. Hello, this is Dr. Eric Mason, founder and pastor of Epiphany Fellowship. Thank you for tuning in today. Hopefully the word of God was a blessing to you. Also, if you want to help us build the kingdom from Philly and beyond, particularly in inner cities, partner with us today. And if you don't know Jesus as Savior, based on his death, burial, and resurrection, place your confidence in him and go from spiritual death to spiritual life. Tune in next time so we can see you go from spiritual infancy to spiritual maturity. God bless you. Take care. We love you.